Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Peter. Episode 121, recorded on June 9th, 2021. Blue Origin finds a new dummy to go to space. Good evening, Jonathan and Peter. Good evening. Hey, Justin. Uh, good evening, yes. Uh, Ryan, unfortunately, had a hug ops moment today and is not joining us because he is sleeping, which, you know, always bad when you have to deal with issues like that. So we'll let him do that and join us again next week uh, here at the Clap Pod. But, uh, yeah, there was uh, other issues this week in Amazon World, too, but uh, that, I don't think it affected him. But uh, I know some other people had some hug ops issues this week. So, but... Uh, Anyways, let's get into some general news. Uh, so this week, Snowflake had their uh, you know virtual summit online and announced some new tools and features in the Snowflake space. And since Snowflake, as we all know, is a pretty big AWS competitor uh, and you know friends and enemies of Amazon <laughs> in regards to Redshift, uh, we thought we'd cover some of their new announcements real quickly here. So first up, they announced a new Snowflake data marketplace, uh, which makes it easier to monetize your data with over 160 providers of data services uh, currently participating in the marketplace uh, with the bulk them selling data commercially as a core part of their business model. And so that's kind of cool if you're looking for those public data sets. Uh, we talked about that on the show for other uh, AWS and Google use cases. So that's now available to you in the Snowflake world. Uh, they have a new Snowpark application development environment uh, that supports Java and Scala programming language, uh, which will support for others coming in the future. Which, when I saw this announcement, I was like, "Oh no, is this a no-code solution for data?" But it wasn't. Scala. That's that's hardcore right there. So I'm happy about that. A uh, new Java user-defined function that will allow IT to deploy custom code and business logic uh, they have developed on the Snowflake platform, as well as the C Snowflake SQL API. Uh, several new governance tools for managing unstructured data with PII to basically classify it and make it hidden as well as new usage dashboard to enable customers to track their crazy snowflake bills when they blow through their consumption model, <laughs> as well as a new integration with Amazon SageMaker Data Wrangler, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the AWS section. So that's a pretty good set of features there from Snowflake this week. Yeah, Data Marketplace uh, just makes so much sense to have that right there built into the platform. Buy it, analyze it, don't have to move it around. Exactly. Mm. I was going to say, I wonder if there's like a, an opportunity for for people to ask for data to, to be delivered to a, to a data lake like that. And it was kind of like the mechanical turd kind of thing where you say, hey, can you go out and take a bunch of pictures of this? Or can you can you go and find me data on this and uh, make it make it a real marketplace where there's buyers and sellers? Mm, that's an interesting idea. You know, hey, I have a, I have a need for this type of thing. I, I want street signs or I want stop signs or yeah. you know, buildings or something. Like that. Yeah, that could be interesting. Um, definitely a crowdsourceable option. Well, next up is uh, Bezos. Literally. Himself. Uh, so we now know why <laughs> July 5th, basically, you know, we, we talked about last week, uh, week before about Andy Jassy, uh, you know, getting ready for the CEO role, which he's taking on July 5th, uh, which we now understand why that is the date for the transition, uh, as Jeff Bezos plans to be the first human flight, uh, uh, be on the first human flight of his Blue Origin uh, spaceship going into space on July, I think, 13th or so, if everything goes on scheduled. Uh, Blue Origin has never sent humans into space. Uh, only using test dummies previously. And so I'm glad to see that Blue Origin has found the right dummy to go into space for the first time. I mean, it's super risky. I mean, even from a, you know the fact that he's not CEO, it's still risky to the shareholders of Amazon that he might you know have an accident going to space that could potentially be very disruptive in the middle of a transition of CEO. Uh, he's still you know on the board. So you know, I see why he's going. I see why uh, you know he's interested in doing this. It would be a big boon if it's successful, but uh, and it gets a lot of media attention. But oh man, the risk to Amazon and to the to the world from a stock market perspective is pretty shaky. Yeah, I wonder what would happen in the event of his death. I mean, I, I assume he has things held in trusts and stuff like that. But a, a huge sell-off of stock would be horrendous. I just think it's funny because you think as people become older and more wealthy, they become more risk averse because more to lose. Apparently, that's not it for for Jeff. I don't know. Maybe he's chasing the the dopamine high. He's done everything else. Or is he's got money for whatever he wants? It's it's kind of the ultimate thrill, I guess. Yes, I, I never knew of Bezos as a big risk taker. <laughs> so, yeah, I know he he was yeah. That's that's interesting that he wants to do that. Well, I mean, I, I hope it goes well. I, I wish all the best, and I hope this flight is successful. And I you know what it would have been a yawn, I wouldn't have even paid attention to it. I may actually now watch the launch because it might be. <laughs> Important. That makes important a, moment. That's a great point. I I will absolutely watch it. And I haven't watched the launch since I can remember. 
I mean, I watched. I remember watching the SpaceX when they launched the car into space, and you know, they made a big hoopla out of that, and it was a big publicity stunt. Uh, that was fun to watch. You know, and my kids really enjoyed it, and you know, all the technology that SpaceX has done. So, you know, Blue Origin kind of put themselves on the map a little bit, and you know, but again, it's, it's risky. So we'll see how it goes. I kind of wonder if he's doing it to to prove a point, since he didn't get the contract to. Uh uh, you went. No, they lost a contract against SpaceX recently. Maybe. Or maybe he's just doing it for fun. Who knows? Yeah, maybe, like maybe he's really an adrenaline junkie. We just never knew it. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, there was an internet outage uh, about for about an hour when Fastly apparently went down, uh, taking down many large internet presences, including Reddit uh, and Amazon.com. Surprisingly enough. Apparently, uh, Amazon.com does not just leverage cloud, uh, you know, CloudFront for their DNS and and uh, acceleration needs. They also are leveraging Fastly, which I mean, from a risk perspective, I get why you maybe do both of them. But um, it did take down Amazon.com as well and many other large ent- entities. Uh, so. Fastly, it was actually very quick to provide information. They were very transparent. Uh, they detected the issue within a minute of the change going into production. Uh, and so basically, the outage was caused by a software update that was shipped to product on May 12th. Uh, with configuration changes by a customer that were enacted, resulted in 85% of their network to return errors. Uh, the outage was detected within one minute of its starting. Engineers worked uh, quickly to find the cause and disable the setting that triggered the problem, and the network recovered. Uh, within about 49 minutes, they said they were about 95% back up. And working as normal, uh, with additional you know 100% completion at about a couple hours later. Uh, then they had a software fix out within five hours of that. Uh, and you know this is one of those areas where you know the the C to, you know one of the SVPs basically put a blog post out there and you know he talked about it as you know the customer had an unexpected configuration or an edge case if you will um, that, and ultimately caused this. But you know the thing that I liked was that he didn't blame the customer. <laughs> he said we should have known, we should have tested for this. This is something we could have caught, we could have detected it, and we're going to do better. Uh, and so, you know, ultimately, you know, just very transparent. This is the right way you want to do RCAs and really address problems and challenges in the market. And so, well done. And you know, honestly, the stock market rewarded them on the day after Fastly stock rose uh, because of how well people said they responded to the outage and how transparent they were. So, you know, all these companies that are worried about the risk of the bad, you know, bad press about an outage and all that stuff. If you do it right and you own it, uh, it can be very, very beneficial to you as well. Yeah, you want to guarantee zero outages, uh, commit to zero innovation. Yep. But if you want to innovate, then expect it, and yeah, how they respond is most important. Mm. It's actually one of the reasons I enjoy living on the West Coast here, because by the time most of these outages have happened, I wake up in the morning, check the phone. <laughs> yeah, really? Oh, it's all done. Just not getting my up? <laughs> not my problem. It didn't affect me. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's how I feel yeah. about 800 outages in other regions. It's like, oh, that one didn't bother me because I'm yeah. not in you know, the <laughs> Mumbai region. <laughs> so, yeah, or Europe for that matter. Yeah, Frankfurt. Well, I have I have regions. I have stuff in Europe. So. Ah, you do. I am, yeah. I am more impacted by that, and I also have stuff in Asia Pac. So, those are those are risks for me. But uh, you know, we're not in all the regions, so that's always helpful. All right, well, let's move on to our normal news stories for the week. AWS has a new uh, feature for Amazon FSx for Windows File Server, which, man, that needs to be shortened down. Can we get get an acronym on this? Because that's rough. Uh, They've added the auditing feature this week. Uh, File access auditing allows you to send logs to a rich set of AWS services so you can query, process, and store your logs. And this is particularly important for your regulated customers in the financial services and healthcare space. Uh, Audit events are published in the Windows event log format, which is a bummer, and can be sent to CloudWatch logs or can Nisa's data firehose, and you can then view them in CloudWatch logs, archive them to S3, or use AWS Partner to review them like Datadog or somebody else. Uh, you can even set up audit events to trigger Lambda functions to notify things like you know notify your security team about unauthorized access or all kinds of different use cases. So this is tremendously flexible on how you can use it with the integrations they've given you. Uh, you do have to have a minimum file throughput capacity of at least uh, 32 megabytes per second, uh, and so that is something to keep in mind. That if you are just you know it's a very lightly used FSx file share, this may not be for you, as it may cost a lot more to enable. Uh, but if this is super real data, this might be the right play, and so definitely take a look at this. Uh, all supported in regions that support. FSX for Windows today. I kind of wonder how, if you have authentication and authorization configured properly, it would detect an unauthorized access to a file. I mean, if it's not authorized, then why'd they give you access to the file? Well, it, it, they're just saying, you know, you don't, you shouldn't have access to the file, and you try to get to it. Why are you trying to get to a file that you're not supposed to have access to? And so that, you know, it may be a security issue or not. Mm. Um, 
just an attempted see. read of attempted read of something that you don't have access to, but you can see. That's kind of weird. All right. But you could you could also, I mean, I would imagine uh, oftentimes people are authorized to use data for specific purposes, and you find out that data was used in an unauthorized fashion, and you want to know who did it, even though they had access to the file. Mm, yeah, like after the fact, kind of. Uh, who took the data? When did they take it? You know, yeah. <laughs> three years later, we're looking at it. Data Why, yeah. Bridge. yeah. Yeah. All right. Moving on to our next story. There's now a third availability zone in AWS China, Beijing region. Uh, this is the third availability zone in that particular region hosted by Sanet. Uh, so if you don't know, the AWS China regions are actually managed by third parties due to uh, Chinese law and government oversight and control. and all of the bad things that that happens in that space. <laughs> but uh, in order to meet the growing demands, they need that third availability zone. Uh, and this brings the total to 81 global availability zones across 25 geographic regions. So it's nice to see additional availability zones anywhere in the world. And there's more coming uh, in other regions as well, per the article. Awesome. Have any of you guys ever done anything with uh, the Chinese AWS accounts? No. Nope. Me neither. We had two customers who were using, are using. I haven't done it myself. And then as a follow-up to the Snowflake story, the Amazon SageMaker Data Wrangler now supports Snowflake as a data source, uh, which keep your friends close and your enemies closer. <laughs> That's all I can say about this. <laughs> the AWS SageMaker Data Wrangler supports using Snowflake as a data source for your machine learning use cases. And with Snowflake as a data source, you can now quickly and easily connect to Snowflake without writing a single line of code which is all great for those no-code solutions. And additionally, you can now join your data in Snowflake with data stored at Amazon S3 and query through Athena and Redshift to prepare the data for your ML workloads. Uh, so I mean, really, once you get the data into Data Wrangler, you can pretty much do whatever you want to with it, even move off of Snowflake back to Redshift, which maybe is the Trojan horse of this announcement. <laughs> <laughs> that would have made a better show title, maybe. <laughs> maybe just, yeah, for customers who see Snowflake as a great data warehouse, but they still want to use Amazon's ML tools and platform. Hey everyone, Jonathan here. I just wanted to take a minute to thank the cloud consulting gurus at Foghorn for helping make the cloud pod possible. These folks truly get it. Cloud consulting experts since 2008, they are premier tier partners with AWS, Google Cloud Platform Silver, and Microsoft Azure partners. From multi-cloud to containers to moving full production workloads to the cloud under the tightest compliance, Foghorn's team of full-stack cloud engineers have been there, done that, gotten the t-shirt, and are ready to share their experience with you. If you're in the market for some talent to supplement your team, visit www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod. www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod. Foghorn, the promise of cloud delivered. All right, moving on to GCP. They are introducing container-native cloud DNS for you guys. Because of course, you know, DNS is the most amazingly scalable, powerful building block of the internet, or it's Achilles' heel, depending on how you, you think about it. Uh, because of how DNS. important it is. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that, John? It's never DNS. <laughs> Never yeah. DNS. And then it's always DNS. It's always DNS. We'll probably, we'll probably find out that the Fastly issue was a DNS issue at some point. Like, that'll be. <laughs> uh, because of how important it is, of course, uh, it's also the beginning of all Kubernetes networking requests. And because of this, Google is pleased to announce the release of their container native cloud DNS, uh, which is a native integration between the cloud, Google Cloud DNS services and GKE to provide you an in cluster uh, DNS resolution uh, service. Several new capabilities are available to you with, when using the cloud DNS, including uh, managed DNS that removes the need for in cluster. DNS pods, which that's just less pods to manage, which is always great. Mm -hmm. uh, DNS resolution local to every GKE node for high throughput, horizontally scalable DNS performance, and a multi regional cross cluster service discovery for GKE capability, and integration with Google Cloud's operation suite for DNS monitoring and logging. Uh, and you can configure this in several different ways, including a cluster scope DNS, uh, which means only the GKE cluster will get its own private DNS zone, so nothing else can see it, or a VPC scope DNS zone, so anything in the VPC can particularly see these DNS entries on top of GKE. Uh, so this is pretty nice. I think, uh, you know, anything to to get some of the complexity out of Kubernetes and into managed services is a win in my book. Yeah, and it was just last week that Amazon did the same thing, didn't they, by turning DNS into a managed service. Was it DNS? Maybe I'm wrong. I remember something like that. But yeah, I mean, cr multi-region cross-cluster service discovery suddenly starts to make the whole platform sound like something you want to run your business on. I guess it also means that the DNS scales with your cluster as well, instead of relying on external DNS and Google having to scale their own service to, to support you, pay for what you use. Yeah, yeah. That's the way the cloud works. 
Well, something that's not very cloud friendly is ITIL. And it's the bane of most DevOps existence, uh, but it's still heavily required in compliance frameworks. And a key portion of that, of course, is asset management and CMDB. And so to address this, uh, a while ago, Google released Google Cloud Asset Inventory, or CAI, as they call it for short, uh, to help these, term, these teams understand their Google Cloud and Anthos environments by providing complete visibility, real-time monitoring, and powerful asset analysis capabilities. Uh, and today, Cloud Asset Inventory gets you four new capabilities that help you understand your environment more clearly and easily than ever before. And those four things are, number one, Cloud Asset Inventory Console. Uh, apparently, there wasn't a console for this. <laughs> or this is now a global console. I'm not really sure what the difference is. But uh, this console now gives you the ability to see your assets and regions, giving you insights into your cloud footprint, history, and details of resource usage with powerful filtering and search capabilities. And you can view the global distribution of resources and policies, or how your GCE VM footprint has been changing over time, as well as a full metadata and change history for all your assets. The next feature, number two, is the new asset list service, which provides a quick and comprehensive asset discovery, including asset history without needing to export the data to a storage destination. Uh, so I guess it's a list of the services that you've deployed. And then they, number three is the ability to answer who can access what resource. Uh, and that is exactly how it's named in the blog, although they do call this uh, the policy analyzer feature, which gives you an authoritative answer to who can read data from my storage bucket that contains PII, or does a terminated employee still have access to remaining systems with the policy analyzer capability? You can thoroughly analyze the relationship between IAM policies and your resources. And the fourth and final feature, the asset posture visibility, which gives you a very quick and easy way to now provide seven types of asset insights through the Active Assist platform. Things like external users that can impersonate people, external members as policy editors, and many, many more that are pretty dull. But uh, exciting if you're using them and you have these compliance questions to answer at the end of the day. That third use case is the one that gets my interest, though, because it's very similar to what people like Fugue and Open Raven are doing in, in terms of mapping who has access to which resources in a way to be proactive about security. So I, I kind of wonder if that's leading up to another decent Google security tool. Yeah, I, you could see that, uh, especially when you're combined with their DLP capabilities. Um, there's some really interesting use cases they can enable with that. I've not actually seen a, a CMDB that was really built for cloud. I mean, they're built for old ITIL people, not for not for cloud. And so, auto scaling groups spin up, and then they've kind of uh, map back to the group itself, and so you get lists of tons of instances which were around for an hour or so, and it's it's difficult to pick through and figure out what actually belonged to what and what what existed for how long. And yeah, this, uh, this should be a, a better way to do this than the ITIL way. Yeah, I don't know that the ITIL way prescribes anything about how to do it, but definitely with cloud infrastructure, you definitely want a different tool to do CMDB. Yeah. The way I always looked at it is when we started doing infrastructure as code, we wrote your CMDB and HCL, and then you push the button and it came to life. So your your code was your CMDB, and uh, um, but it makes so much more sense for it to actually just be coming from the provider themselves because they know exactly what you have. Yep. You don't have to worry about the one router that somebody forgot about when you switched network managed service providers that's been running for 10 years happily goes out and nobody knows what it is, where it is, or why the site is down. Yeah, I guess the problem is that that ITIL framework has been around for, what, 20 years now, at least? Oh, more than that. And Yeah, probably. Yeah. And, they, and uh, I, I apologize that it, that it came out of the British government, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> bygones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I mean, I think it is ITIL v5 now, which you know, was the first one that they got a little more cloud religion into the v5. But uh, you know, it's it's yeah, it, it has, has a lot of very archaic processes. I mean, they make sense for IT shops. They make less sense for SaaS businesses and for cloud services, etc. So. Yeah, I guess I guess it makes it difficult for people who are in a transition from their own data centers to, to cloud, though, if they, have, if they have controls in place that require things like CMDB and they have those established processes and agents collecting data you know, like they have done for years, to start branching off into cloud and not be able to use those tools in the same way make it very difficult from a, a compliance perspective. So, yeah. yeah. Or a lot of education to your compliance people to teach them how the way of yeah. the cloud works. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, well, people who really love ITIL are most likely Windows users who would like to migrate them to Google Cloud. <laughs> and Google thinks they're the best place to migrate and modernize your workload, no matter your migration strategy or what your uh, what value you're looking to achieve. Uh, but they don't want you, they don't want you to have to take their sales promises as gospel because you know if a salesperson is talking, they're lying to you. And so they're giving you a new Microsoft Win on Windows uh, on Google Cloud demo center without any commitment or friction. The demo center uses a hands-on guided simulation to walk you through several scenarios to solve business critical challenges 
challenges with GCP. Because they're only simulated, you'll see how it works without any deployment, configuration, or commitment, or cost. And it's absolutely not a sales tool. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> Your salesperson said so. Yeah. I think it's a clever idea, though, right? Because uh, for people who are new to the cloud and haven't done a migration or haven't done a thing, you know, maybe they're trying to go justify an, an investment in cloud or they're trying to go do something, but they don't really know where to start. So how do you even size it? At least with this, you can kind of go see, oh, this is how you move a server from here to here. This is how you do these processes. And that actually might be a good educational tool as well, just to give people the, the concepts to then go pitch the, an idea to move to Google Cloud or to move to AWS or Azure. Um, so you know, yes, it's a sales tool, 1,000%. But I, I'm actually surprised no one else has thought of this as an idea, because it, it's kind of brilliant. Now, I don't know why it's limited to just Windows. I think Linux would also be a ripe uh, option for this as well. Um, or there's other scenarios too, like taking an application and moving it into containerization. Um, there's lots of different ways you can do that with simulation too. So I think there's interesting ideas here which could be copied by others. Maybe people assume that Linux is easy and that it's never a big deal to, to move a Linux workload, but Windows it is it's, uh, it has this barrier of entry. I mean, it's true. It does have some barriers to entry, like Active Directory and others, but uh, you know, I don't think it's any more complicated or less complicated, other than you know, the, the technologies are not as mature, typically, in the Windows infrastructure side. So, so what, nah. what, what is this running on? It's a simulation. It's not real. What's the difference between a simulated virtual machine and a virtual machine? It's just something there. I, I don't even think it's really a machine. I think it's a video of a machine, or it's. I bet a, there's really a machine back there. I bet there's really a server behind. I mean, the maybe maybe server. there is. It's not a live demo. A live demo will be too unreliable. It's it's a pre-recorded. <laughs> yeah, or it's a very highly orchestrated set of mock APIs that basically mock it for you, so you can see what the process would look like, but it isn't really doing anything in the background. Is my guess. Uh, so our next story is not a new feature necessarily. I think we've had this for a little while, but uh, it was new to me. So I'm going to tell you about it. <laughs> and so, so you know, if you are one of those companies who really got into Pivotal Cloud Foundry and did a lot of work with their platform as a service, and now you're trying to move to Kubernetes and the cloud, uh, you may know that that's a quite difficult process. <laughs> uh, and so getting that existing Cloud Foundry product to Kubernetes is a no trivial matter, especially if you want to avoid code changes or take on big process changes, uh, unless you're using this new KF tool. And so this KF tool is a Google Cloud service that allows you to easily move existing Cloud Foundry workloads to Kubernetes with minimal disruption. Uh, KF features a CLI, also named KF, that replaces the existing Cloud Foundry CF command utility. And so you just literally take your CF commands that you're running, apply them to KF, and then apply them to whatever your pod is. And Google handles all of your translation layer to get your Cloud Foundry uh, containers basically running on top of Kubernetes in a very streamlined, simple way. So I think that's kind of neat. And if you're in the Cloud Foundry space and you're trying to get there, this might be a great accelerator for you and another another good pathway to Google. Yeah, I haven't touched Cloud Foundry in so many years. I haven't either, but you know, we've had uh, guests of the show <laughs> who are very familiar with Cloud Foundry who uh, probably are very aware of some of the challenges around this. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was new to me. I, I missed the announcement when they, I don't know how long this has been out there, but uh, it's been out there for a while. Are they still around or do they shut down? I mean, Pivotal is still around, but I think Pivotal's you know started moving more and more to Kubernetes as kind of the underlying piece of it, and so I, I, you know, AK Native is also the other big thing they're kind of pivoting to. So I think they're they're definitely you know kind of going the way of the dodo <laughs> in some ways, yep. but uh, we'll see. Well, we talked previously about a Google Artifact Registry, and it was were limited at the time to, I believe, just containers. Uh, but now you can now move your Google Artifacts, or sorry, your Java, Node.js, and Python Artifacts into the Google Artifact Repository uh, with your existing container images and Helm charts, uh, all for the low, low price of $0.10 cents per gigabyte per month after your first uh, half gigabyte of storage. So glad to see they're getting a little bit additional capabilities. Hopefully, we'll still get NuGet and some of the other uh, very popular uh, languages to go into the Artifact Registry sometime. In the next couple months. Yeah, this is good actually. I, I really enjoy that they have Python because it's uh, you know nobody wants to pay for Artifact and it's nice to have private repos and to be able to spin something like this up and, and use it yeah. makes uh, CI/CD really really quite nice. 
Yeah, it, it makes. I think like companies like Artifactory and these others, you know, like they're under attack. I, I don't think they're reacting well to the cloud world. I mean, I, they they always have that world that says I, I don't want my artifacts, you know, in the cloud. I don't want them on premise. But you know that that world may go away. What if they start offering you artifact services on top of Anthos or on top of uh, EKS anywhere or on top of these other services? Now all of a sudden you're a major threat, and I don't think they're prepared for that kind of threat at this point. No, and yeah. this is this is the kind of service that Google could run. At a loss or at cost as an enabler for adoption in general. And so, I, yeah, I'd be very worried if I was you know, JFrog. Yeah. Well, that's why I think that's why I see them pivoting a little bit. You know, they got into container image security runtime stuff, they got into some other security things. I think they're looking for that path to growth again, which, you know, be interesting to see. Well, Google is releasing a fully managed zero trust security solution using their traffic director with GKE and their CA services. And so when platform admins and security professionals think about modernizing their apps with a forward looking security posture, they look for zero trust security. I like to know those people, by the way, the platform admins and security professionals who have a forward looking perspective. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to know them. <laughs> Uh, this security is based on a few fundamental building blocks, including uh, means of allocating and asserting a service identity, mutual authentication, encryption for all traffic, authorization checks and minimal privileges, and infrastructure to make all of the above manageable and reliable. And so with the new traffic director managing your service to service security, you can now enjoy end-to-end -end encryption, service level auth, and granular authorization policies for your service mesh. Uh, so this is great. I think this is a nice implementation of zero trust. Just kind of start seeing their zero trust enterprise idea really taking flight in their products, which I'm super happy to see. I wish it was a really good demo of this, actually. I was hoping they'd have some kind of video or some kind of walkthrough, because it's, it's something which is becoming definitely more popular. Yep. The, uh, they did have some good videos from Google Next uh, on the Zero Trust Enterprise that might get you a good start in place. But uh, I suspect this will be a big topic of Google Next this year, too, because this is a big area of investment for companies, especially with COVID and, and all the new work from home stuff. Um, this going to be a, a big deal. Well, moving on to Azure and the Azure Virtual Desktop, or formerly known as the Windows Virtual Desktop. <laughs> they released their virtual desktop product. Uh, they never predicted that a global pandemic would come and force millions of workers home, and organizations of the world would migrate important apps and data to the cloud to gain business resilience. And so as organizations enter the new phrase of hybrid work, uh, customers, uh, sorry, Azure is now going to help them with renaming their product to Azure Virtual Desktop, and they're also releasing a slew of new features for Azure Virtual Desktop, including the ability to now connect your Azure Desktop to your Azure Active Directory, which I don't know where this worked, but how this ever worked. <laughs> like, what did it authenticate against before? Like, your own domain, or is that why it was a Windows service, not an Azure service? Uh, you now enroll your Azure Virtual Desktops in the Endpoint Manager, uh, which previously only supported physical devices. And so on provisioning, you actually now end up to Endpoint uh, Manager, which will now you know, make sure you can provide application views and make sure it's compliant with your requirements. There's a new Quick Start experience, which will allow you to streamline onboarding experience uh, for Azure Virtual Desktops in the Azure portal, and new pricing options for remote app streaming to allow employers to stream just the application necessary to a computer. So instead of the whole VDI workspace, you get just the application UI it looks like a native application on the end user computer. Uh, and this new user access pricing options will go into effect on January 1st, 2022. Uh, to help orgs start now, they're offering a special promotion with no charge access to Azure VD for streaming, first party, or third party apps external users from July 14th to December 31st. So if you are trying to do this, or you want to do this, this is a great time to do a POC because it's free until end of the year. I'm thinking about nightmares of Citrix Metaframe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do remember Metaframe. What's new in the technology? Though? I mean, is it really just a rebrand and a hey, reminder that we're still here kind of thing? Because apps, I know individual app streaming has been a thing internal. So yeah, I mean, it's time. really just it's really a rebranding and a tighter enablement into Azure. That's how I see it. And I, think, I think it actually brings it more in parity with what AWS and Google are doing. And the this is that you know, hey, you could use these desktops to access your your cloud resources and do that in a secure way without having to do VPNs. Like, there's so many things that enables when it's now tied into Azure. Uh, versus being this kind of standalone uh, island onto itself, and so I think that's what you're seeing is a big feature here, as well as the endpoint manager. Is you know Microsoft admitting that you know our endpoint stuff is pretty decent for physical devices. Why doesn't it work in virtual um, devices as well? I think that's a good move. So it's obviously a sign that they think the world's going to stay a lot more hybrid than it was before. Yeah. I, mean, I think like, everyone's taking a hard look at that question right now, and even the companies that are trying to force it, I think, are struggling to get people to actually go back. Yeah, so Amazon were going to permit two days a week work from home, and Mark Zuckerberg said that uh, he really enjoys working from home and he's been more productive and he's happy to let people work from home indefinitely at this point, which is actually really surprising. 
it's interesting to me that no one's really connected the dots that what they're enjoying is they're enjoying the privacy of having a dedicated space that doesn't get interrupt driven. Yeah. And that their open their open floor plan office spaces that they spent so much money on are actually what their people are not missing from COVID. And so if you had a different office structure that you know gave people areas for privacy and to get into you know flow and all those kinds of things to get better productive, people might be more willing to go back. But now they've had you know, 18 months in my office where I can close the door and I can just concentrate or I can schedule my afternoon and no one's going to bother me because my calendar is blocked out. Uh, I think people are enjoying that and the reality of what a private office kind of gets you versus an open floor plan, bull plan, uh, which is also very problematic in a COVID world where it's spread by air. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> lots of reasons why I think we're having a really hard look at how offices work in general. Yeah. And I mean, I've read some just office specific studies that just they did they did they thought it was a good idea they did the math and it's not it's not as productive overall for listeners of the cloud pod you know that i have no love for microsoft active directory which is why i'm excited to tell you about the leading cloud directory platform jump cloud jump cloud makes it easy to solve today's it challenges by unifying device and user management through a single pane of glass enabling you to securely manage your users and devices and perform common tasks like onboarding and offboarding remote workers with JumpCloud, you no longer need to implement an on-premise Active Directory infrastructure or additional tooling to scope a user's access, and you can ensure that the user is coming from trusted devices and networks. Enabling JumpCloud's Zero Trust solutions improves the security and compliance of your network, ensuring users have access only to the services they need when they need them. To start your organization's move to a modern, secure hybrid work model, try JumpCloud for free today at cloud.jumpcloud.com slash the cloud pod. That's cloud.jumpcloud.com slash the cloud pod. Well, our last story for the week is uh, pricing changes to Azure Sentinel and Azure Monitor logs. Uh, and so they're changing the pricing structure starting June 2nd. So already happened. Sorry. <laughs> Capacity reservations are their new cap- are now being renamed to commitment tiers. And you can now have larger commitments all the way up to 5 terabytes a day of log and Sentinel analysis. Uh, data ingested beyond your commitment will now be billed using the effective commitment rate tier instead of reverting to the pay-as-you-go rate, which was super awful before because you'd hit that one terabyte commitment or capacity reservation, and then all of a sudden you're paying rack rates again. <laughs> For anything over that, that's a terrible scenario. Uh, so I'm glad to see that get fixed. And then the simplified commitment tiers, uh, now with only eight of them, and no longer needing to manage them due to minor changes in your ingestion. So if you needed to maintain your cost analysis and cost breakdown, you'd have to be constantly changing your commitment tiers all the time to keep that in line. Otherwise, you get a surprise bill. So that's all gone now, which is great. So this is just a pretty obvious to me <laughs> seeming uh, announcement that they should have done in the initial release but you know they just didn't have the consideration that people might have up to 5 terabytes a day of logs but you know logging is taking over the world the more things we yeah, the more it's right the cheaper the storage gets uh, the more things we choose to log like file access logs it's just going to keep growing growing and growing pl- please archive it cuz you don't really need it after <laughs> six months and other than yeah. for compliance reasons and then even then your compliance is one to two years and then you should really throw it away so all right that's it for new news peter do you want to take us to the lightning round would well, love to um all right so you can now identify and copy existing objects to use s3 bucket keys reducing cost of server-side encryption with the aws key managed service and just removing the taxes remove those taxes I mean, they couldn't call it a price cut, but they're telling you not to use a better service and to use the S3 native encryption. Is, it's crazy. I just don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> they're just fixing it. Just fixing it. Always something to make better. Don't use this. We can't make it cheap enough. It doesn't sound like a great sales pitch. Right. Yeah. Amazon EKS pods running on AWS Fargate now support custom security groups. Asking the question, what did it do before? Like, just port 80, port 443, that's all you got? Is that really how that worked? I don't remember that. All open to everything. (laughs) Amazon Key Spaces now supports customer-managed customer master keys for encryption of data at rest to help you meet your compliance and regulatory requirements. So I had to ask the question, does the Amazon Key Space store the customer master keys in a key store? (laughs) Like, is it... Is it because key space is all the way around? Like key space stores the key space key, so if the customer, and then it like, it just goes on forever. Eventually, uh, no matter where you get to, they've got the keys. They, yeah, use, they use the S3 bucket keys in the end. That's the only thing they can afford. Yeah, really. How do you secure those? <laughs> oh. 
Just put in a key value. So my, luggage, key spaces. my luggage password. Bezos's luggage password. You think it takes luggage to the space station? You know, went to space with him because it's just a—it's like a three-hour flight, isn't it? Up and down. Is there luggage involved? Is he check a bag? Or does, he get, is he, does he have status on Blue Origin to not have to check a bag? Like, does he get it for free? He should. Somebody, you'd imagine he gets it for free. And you then think so. I would imagine he get a free drink too, but probably comes in a tube. I'd imagine. <laughs> Very possible. Yes. Amazon SNS now supports SMS Sandbox and displays available origination IDs in your account. Can't wait for people to not realize they're in a sandbox, just like they do for SMS, or sorry, for email sending, SES, uh, and then have a call. Like, hey, I can't send any more mails. Only, I sent 100, and now it's broken. Oh, it's because you're still in sandbox mode. Sorry. Oops. Yeah, that's the worst, worst user experience ever. <laughs> mm-hmm. Can you turn it on? Uh, nope. And then, and then they, you know, to get that turned on to go from a sandbox in SES to a production account, you have to justify your existence of why you're doing such a thing. Like, what do you mean you want to send email from a server? Like, how dare you have such a such a ridiculous idea? It just feels like that yes. friction. Prove to us your motives are virtuous. Makes it feel dizzy. <laughs> AWS Glue Studio now allows you to specify streaming ETL job settings. <laughs> is it glue? Is it an ETL? What is it really at the end of the day? I mean, like they they so, try so hard to not call it an ETL, and then they add features that say streaming ETL jobs. <laughs> like, come on, make, make your mind. Is it is it ETL or is it not? I got nothing. It's not Spackle, that's for sure. Amazon SageMaker model registry now supports rollback of deployed models. I guess they really needed a way to roll back the you know racist addition uh, they just did to oh, it. Oh God. So, Oops, that oops, that model was bad. We gotta roll that one back to make the bot and the ML not so racist. You gotta, that's why you need that one. <laughs> <laughs> Google Cloud VMware Engine is now HIPAA compliant. That's great. Just every, every time you log in to use it, it's gonna ask you to, to sign the form to say you've received all the paperwork. Yeah. Just one more reason the healthcare industry will not modernize because now they can just use VMware. Great. Thanks, Google. Yeah, it's probably something that people in the rest of the world don't realize, and, and, unless you've lived here in the U.S., just quite how messed up this whole thing is. Like every doctor's office you go to, you, you, get, you have to sign a thing to say you've received the paperwork that they actually probably haven't given you anyway, <laughs> which explains their commitment to your privacy. It's yeah. We get about that, but the one this week that blows my mind is that UHC, United Healthcare, oh. which is one of the the largest healthcare providers in the country, <laughs> is now going to deny your emergency visit claim if it wasn't an emergency that you went for. But you know, they're oh. relying on you as a human to know an emergency that you should go, or should not go to the emergency room, and now you take this risk. Like It's just a terrible policy. So I, I suspect that's going to get rolled back, but yeah, there's a lot of backlash on that this week. Yeah. They're not the first insurer to do it. And that's, that's the other thing. And, and the, the others got away with it, so they probably will too. And I, I don't see the law changing under the current you know, setup that we have. I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 it's just it's a bad. Rec- yeah. I recommend that. I, I wouldn't, you know, if I was a doctor, I wouldn't need to go to the ER to find out if it was an emergency. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's the thing. Like, you, you know, you have you have chest pain or something like that, and it's like, is this heartburn or is this a heart attack? Well, I don't want to go to the hospital because I might get charged if it's just heartburn. Uh, but you know, it's a high risk. And then there's also scenarios where you know, like in the middle of the night, there is no doctor you can go to or urgent care. You only choice you have is the emergency room. Yeah, so, yeah. Especially I, for a dad of little kids <laughs> who go to the emergency room more than I've ever been to the emergency room that I can recall. <laughs> uh, you know, it's one of those risks that you take if you're on United Healthcare or any other other providers who have the same policy. It'd be curious to see, yeah, if it's like. It's one of those things where, because obviously insurance policy, insurance, health insurance companies run on razor thin margins. So, you know, are they exploiting this now? And it's going to be like, you got to justify every single uh, visit, or is it really just to catch those outliers, like the people who take their hotspot and put the, put it on their roof with a big antenna on it and publish the uh, address to everyone driving by on the freeway. And they're just going to catch those people who are, uh, you know, going in to get their earwax out and they didn't want to schedule an appointment with the with their doctor, so they went to the ER. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I get that it's very expensive. They called it the most expensive door to the hospital. And I get that it's mm-hmm. expensive just because of the nature of having that, that kind of stuff on call and available all the time. But, you know, we don't know. We're not trained. How do you know if, if this particular thing is an emergency? How do you know if there's not any other underlying conditions or something which could, could make what would be normal? 
or say for somebody else to wait till the next day. It would be a big yeah. disaster, so... Anyway, yeah, we will only know if we only won't know when we get the news articles about who they declined. <laughs> yep. Are they declining people with chest pains who just had heartburn, or are they just declining the people with the earwax? We'll, yeah. we'll find out. Rat hole over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go to Azure, who is advancing in data in data center critical environment infrastructure availability. Man, this is so. This is the monthly blog post from the CTO Mark Rosinovich at Azure, which we normally talk about every every month when he releases because he typically talks about something interesting. And unfortunately, his blog post has turned into a sales pitch this week and saying, "Hey, we have this new critical infrastructure you can buy at way more higher prices to you know rely your run your critical environment workloads." You know, just that was very disappointing, and so I just put it here to mock it mercilessly because. You know, a really great blog series now turned into a sales pitch, and I, I've lost interest. So we'll see if see if that trend continues, or maybe this is just an anomaly uh, this month. Maybe he will hear you and look back at his previous uh, blogs and and revert. Take me back to the tardigrade. That was that yes. was awesome. Yes. Wow. That was a uh, that was a rather subdued round. We had very few stories and. Not much to say, really. I, I, I blame the stories, not the contestants. Um, I'm, I guess I'm just going to give it to Justin for the uh, rollback. GMS tax. Nice. Oh, that was good too. Okay. Yeah. Take. He almost Take lost it. it though later on, but I'll, I'll let uh, you hold, hang on to that. <laughs> Well, that's good. Uh, so things coming up. Once again, we have a couple things for you guys. First up is the Digital Manufacturer Summit from Google on June 22nd. This will be the last time we mention it. So if this is your last chance to sign up before it happens. Uh, and then we got our, our, you know, last week I called for people to uh, send us uh, things you have to pitch. You know, we'd love to talk. We'd love to support our community and, and really drive people to different conferences. And so the State of FinOps update, uh, which is a monthly release, has asked us to pimp their monthly updates. The next one will be in July. We just passed the June one. Uh, and so if you follow the link in the show notes, uh, you can go sign up for the State of FinOps monthly report where they basically run through all kinds of great topics uh, and things that may interest you, especially if you're in the cloud FinOps space uh, or just interested in cloud spend management in general. Uh, in June, they covered things like accurate forecasting, uh, tracking cloud TCO, multi-cloud uh, working group efforts, and then much, much more than that. So there's lots of really great content. Check it out. Uh, I have joined a few of them over the over the last few years. I've been part of the FinOps Foundation as well, and it's it's a great thing to do. Uh, the Reinforced Conference is still coming up uh, in Houston in August. It's still going to be hot. That has not changed. Global warming has not helped us in this scenario. So uh, if you're going to Reinforce, get signed up for that right away. I do believe I've heard rumor that next week uh, they will be announced or opening up reInvent uh, registration for November 29th through December 3rd. And then Google Cloud Next still has not said anything about being on-premise uh, in San Francisco. But Dreamforce, with my research, uh, is going to be in person September 21st through the 23rd, which is you know three or four weeks before the Google Cloud Next. So it's leaning towards us going to be in person in San Francisco. So if you're interested in Google Cloud Next, that is coming up as well in October. Hopefully we'll get more details on that uh, in the next month or so. And that is it for things coming up. Anything you guys want to add? Nope. None here. Awesome. And that is the week in the cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Foghorn Consulting and Jump Cloud. Check out our website, the home of the Cloud Pod, where you can join our newsletter, Slack team, and send feedback or ask questions at thecloudpod.net or tweet us with the hashtag thecloudpod.net.